everybody, we're back. And we did a little bit of a switch in our lineup uh, due to some of our virtual. So I just wanna let you know that Breaking the Chain of Infection will be up next. And my dear friend, Tamara, um, I, I can't say enough about Tamara, which is why she's one of my favorite speakers because she has passion for infection, sterilization, you name it. Steris is by far one of the companies that we stand behind because we know that they take all of this so serious. So let me just tell you a little bit about Tamara. And she holds a master's degree in nursing administration. And she's currently the clinical education specialist with over 15 vast clinical nursing leadership and healthcare experience. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on her bio. You certainly can pick that up later because she's such a great speaker. We're also going to give her a few extra minutes. And if there are questions, she will take questions and answers. Also, for questions and answers, they will be answered uh, either during the program if there's time or there will be a whole list of questions and answers that we will send to you with the video. Take it away, Tamara. Thank you, Marcy, for that warm welcome. I appreciate it very much so. And welcome, everyone, to Breaking the Chain of Infection. Um, one of the things that you need to think about is tuberculosis. A lot of people don't talk about it anymore, but it actually claims a life every 21 seconds in the world. And billions of others suffer the effects of infections similar to this. As healthcare workers, you have an obligation to prevent the spread of infection. This program reviews the chain of events that can lead to the spread of infections and provide strategies to break that chain. So the only disclosures that I have today is that I work for Steris. Um, I do not receive any compensation for this. I'm an employee of them and this is my um, direct role. Any commercial products referred to or seen during this presentation do not constitute a commercial support by myself. You can receive continuing education credit hours if you would like to for today's presentation. Um, just go ahead and either email myself or Marcy and I will make sure I get those to you with an evaluation to fill out. Um, for this particular presentation, Steris is an approved provider of continuing education for CBRN and BASC. This program is approved for one contact hour for CBRN, CBSPD, and ISHM. Participants must be present for the entire presentation to receive continuing education credit. So preventing infections requires an all hands on deck approach to breaking the chain of events that can lead to them. It is necessary to create infection prevention policies, procedures, and practices for the entire facility. The work of the sterile processing department is a critical infection prevention function, but first let's take a deeper dive into the mechanisms of infection prevention. Today, you will have the learning objectives of being able to name three factors that contribute to the spread of infections, be able to state the infection transmission pathways, and identify ways to break that chain of infection in sterile processing departments. So what exactly is an infection? It's an invasion of body tissues by disease-causing agents, their multiplication and the reaction of the body to the infectious agents and their toxins. So the response to the infection is what we call symptoms. It is how we feel and what is happening to us while we're ill with that infection. Everybody's body responds in different ways, but some are ordinary like a runny nose, a cough, diarrhea, or a fever. So it's important to understand that there are also life-threatening responses. The life-threatening responses that you may see might be pneumonia, hemorrhage, tissue necrosis, seizures, organ failure, and even up to and including death. So we have all experienced it. The virus that kept your coworker home for a day, made you suffer for a week. However, your husband or wife never got it. Whether you get sick, come close to dying, or simply do not become infected relies on many factors. A healthy immune system with proper vaccinations or acquired immunity can prevent illness. Your gender can have a significant difference. Women are more prone to a urinary tract infection than men, for example. This may be obvious, but your health impacts the ability to get an infection. Diabetics have a higher probability for fungal infections in the mouth, feet, or skin folds. The older you get, the less efficiently the body's immune system works and the higher probability that you will become more susceptible to illness. The last factor, genetics, continues to find new links between one's genetic profile and susceptibility to infections. 
An example of genetic susceptibility is malarial infections. People with normal DNA have normal shaped red blood cells that allow them to be infected with malaria. However, those with the genetic difference that leads to sickle cell anemia have a protection against malaria. So in healthcare, we encounter people who have multiple factors working against them. It is our job to prevent infections in this highly at-risk population. So we must understand that infections require three things to spread. First, they need an infected person. The infected person carries the infectious agent, allowing it to multiply. They are called the reservoir. The reservoir also creates an opportunity for the infectious agents to leave their body and be transmitted to the next person. Second is transmission. It occurs by direct contact with the infected person or by indirect contact with something carrying the infectious agent. Lastly, the infectious agent must come into contact with a susceptible host. That is to say, a person who can be infected. The susceptible host becomes a new reservoir. The susceptible host becomes infected, transforming into a reservoir, and the cycle begins again. One really good example of this is um, some of the waterborne illnesses that we see here in the Northeast. I had a basset hound at my last house, and we used to have these big divots in the driveway. And after it would rain, it never failed. He would run over those divots and he would just start drinking water, right? Well, that was the reservoir. And the reservoir held a nasty bug that got into his gut. So it transmitted to him when he drank the water. He then became that susceptible host, was actually able to transmit that agent to my second dog um, when he would defecate. So you think about that, um, that transmission process, and that kind of gives you like an understanding, a little easier understanding. So infections are caused by many different types of infectious agents, but without a reservoir, they can't do anything. The reservoir is a person who is infected with that agent, and the reservoirs can infect others by shedding infectious agents. The first step to creating a reservoir is exposing the person to that infectious agent. After the agents enter the body, the body will launch defenses to destroy that infection. When the agents can hide from the body's defenses or overwhelm it, they multiply in the body to levels that allow them to escape by shedding from the body. Once out of the body, the agents move to the next person and infect them. Reservoirs can be shedding infectious materials but have no signs of illness. This happens during the incubation time of the disease. The incubation time is the time after infection, but before the onset of symptoms. Incubation times vary greatly among illnesses. Here are some examples of illnesses that you may have known and their incubation time. Influenza and AIDS or HIV are caused by viruses. A person infected by the flu virus, H1N1 or H3N2, will show flu symptoms in two to four days. However, a person infected with HIV will not typically show symptoms for 40 to 60 days after infection. Lyme disease and MRSA are caused by bacteria. Lyme disease infections show symptoms about three, three days after exposure. MRSA is typically two to five days. Malaria and toxoplasmosis are protozoan infections. Though limited to returning travelers, malarial infections take seven to 30 days before symptoms appear. Toxoplasmosis keeps pregnant mothers out of cat litter boxes due to the danger of this protozoan, causing developing infants infected during gestation or birth. This protozoan infection takes five to 23 days before symptoms are seen. Tapeworms and pinworms are two parasitic worms. Infected persons may not show symptoms for eight to 10 days after infection with a tapeworm, and it can be 30 to 60 days for pinworms. Two months seems like a long time. However, the last example takes 11 to 12 years before symptoms appear. CJD. It is caused by an abnormal protein called a prion. Prion infections have the longest incubation period of 11 to 12 years. There are even cases where symptoms never develop. In some cases, a person may become infected and never become ill or show any signs of infection. These people are called carriers. Carriers are infected and actively producing materials with infectious agents. These infectious agents may be passed on to a susceptible host 
without the carrier's knowledge. This means that they can infect others without even knowing it. The most famous carrier is typhoid Mary. Mary Malone was an Irish American cook who is believed to be responsible for spreading typhoid fever to hundreds of people, causing three confirmed deaths and suspected of 48 additional deaths. Mary had become infected with the typhoid fever bacteria, but never showed any signs. She always maintained that she was healthy. Due to this belief, she never took precautions to prevent the spread of the disease. She was ultimately placed in permanent quarantine by New York State to prevent her continued transmission of typhoid fever. Working in healthcare, we have the potential to be a typhoid Mary. Even more alarming, the organisms do not have to be deadly pathogens. The human body has 100 trillion microbes. They make up the human microbiome. The human microbiome is the culmination of all of the microbes that reside on or within human tissues and biofluids along with the anatomical sites where they reside. This includes your skin, mammary glands, seminal fluid, placenta, uterus, lungs, saliva, oral mucosa, biliary tract, gastrointestinal tract, just to name a few. Some microorganisms like those found in the gut are necessary for good health. Some only live there, yet others have the potential to cause disease, but the body's defenses keep them from doing so. A healthy person fights and wins against these types of microbes preventing illness. For example, we can shake hands and not become ill. However, people in poor health, the very young or old, those that are immunocompromised, and persons recovering from a medical condition or post-surgical intervention are more likely to get sick from these normal, normally harmless microorganisms. These normally harmless microorganisms that can cause infections are called opportunistic organisms. Many opportunistic organisms live in and on healthy people. Staphylococcus epidermidis is a regular resident of human skin where it lives without hurting its host. However, it is a common source of infection for indwelling medical devices such as catheters and drain tubes. Staphylococcus aureus is another common organism which lives within the ears, nose, and throat. It too can cause infection in an immunodepressed individual. The most well-known cause of staph infections is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. This may be hard to believe, but Streptococcus pneumoniae lives in the nose, throat, and mouth. Normally, Strept pneumoniae does nothing to the body. However, when the conditions are just right, the organism can migrate to the lungs, causing pneumonia. The three examples of opportunistic organisms, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Staphylococcus aureus, and Streptococcus pneumoniae are all bacteria. However, infections can be caused by many things. Understanding the different types of infectious agents helps identify the best way to prevent their movements to a new host. Bacteria are the most reported infectious agent for hospital-associated infections. Bacteria are classified in many ways starting with their shape. Bacillus are rod-shaped bacteria. They often have structures called flagella and pili that when move, propel the bacteria through their environment. Cocci, a spherical bacteria, they can be found individually, grouped in clusters, or in long chains. Spherochets are the last shape. This group represents bacteria that are coiled or spiral shaped. They can also have flagella or pili to help with locomotion. The majority of bacteria are found in their vegetative form. The vegetative form is the active form of the bacteria. If it is a pathogenic species, this is the form found in the infection site. Some bacteria can also make a dormant form called the endospore. The endospore is a protected um, bacteria. They form when vegetative bacteria find themselves in less than ideal conditions. This means that as a spore forming bacteria prepare to leave the body of an infected patient, the vegetative cells will turn into endospores and be deposited on environmental surfaces where they will lay dormant waiting to infect the next patient. The bacteria that form endospores often live in mixed populations of vegetative and spores. The ratio between vegetative and spore forms will vary depending on the environment they find themselves in. The harsher the environment, the more spores. Spores form within the bacteria. 
Each spore contains the genetic material and critical cellular components within a protective capsule. The spore contains very little water and the combination of the spore capsule and low water content makes the spore very resistant to damage caused by heat, cold, and chemicals. In this protective state, endospores can survive for many years. In fact, the oldest living endospore was found in New Mexico. It was 250 million years old. Fungal infections are typically found in the skin, airways, mouth, and throat. Though reports have included fungal infections within the stomach. Fungi are highly diversified organisms that are seen in two forms. The first is easily seen with the naked eye. These include molds, mushrooms, and mildew. Fungi also occur as oval-shaped single-cell microscopic forms called yeasts. Just like bacteria, fungi can form spores. The fungal spore is a specialized cell that has a very thick cell wall, and the thick cell wall protects the spore from heat, cold, and chemicals. Fungal spores can survive six to 25 years. Viruses are the simplest form of microbes. Though they can multiply, it requires the virus to hijack the reproductive tools of a living cell, which we have seen over the last year with coronavirus. It uses that process to make more viruses. All viruses consist of nucleic material enclosed within a protein coat called a capsid. The capsid protects the nucleic acid from the environment. Some viruses also produce an outer coating and that outer coating envelopes the virus creating a layer. The viruses with the layer are called enveloped viruses while the ones without the layer are called non-enveloped viruses. The enveloped contains several materials that protrude from it. It is believed that the protruding materials help to camouflage the virus from the patient's natural defenses, including white blood cells. Parasites live on and in the human body. Parasites can inhabit the skin, lungs, liver, heart, muscle, and brain. They feed off the person they live on or in. Some parasites are insects like head lice and fleas. Others are parasitic worms. Though the majority of parasitic worms are visible under normal magnification, However, their oocysts or eggs and larvae are microscopic. Protozoa are microscopic single cell animals found throughout the world. They have been known to infect the digestive tract, bloodstream and brain. Protozoans are the cause of amoebiasis, malaria, toxoplasmosis, giardia and trichomoniasis to name a few. Parasitic protozoan often have a second form called the protozoan cyst. The protozoan cyst is a thick walled form of the protozoan that allows it to withstand harsh environments. I can tell you a really interesting story about protozoa. My very first infection prevention role, I lived in the Midwest um, and I worked in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, there was a trend going around with the local college um, kids, adults, young adults, where they would go down to the Missouri River and they would party. Of course, it required a little bit of alcohol. And they would take the crayfish out of the river and they would dare each other to eat the crayfish raw. And what these um, unsuspecting young adults did not know is that there was a protozoan living in those, um, those little animals. And so one of those gentlemen came into our facility and was ill with an upper, with a, with a, a lung illness of some type. So you, you bronch the patient, you test all of those, those bronch um, results. And we ended up finding these little cysts um, in the lungs. So what happened was they digest it, right? So the person who's susceptible digests um, these protozoa and it goes through their system, right? And what happens is, is it gets into the intestine and it lays these, these eggs and cysts. And so then the cysts are then transported fecal orally. And when that happened, it got into the gentleman's lungs and made him very ill. But it was really interesting because um, it, this kind of illness is not find, found very easily. Um, and it just so happened that the bronch sample actually produced the cysts from these particular animals. And so um, it definitely was a trend in the Midwest for a period of time, but it was definitely an, an interesting topic to learn from. Um, good example of what can happen. 
So prions are the last infectious agents. Prions are abnormal proteins which can significantly impact the nervous system, specifically the brain. A protein is a protein is not a prion is not a living organism. This infection agent duplicates itself by changing normal proteins within the body into the same abnormal protein as the prion. It takes many years for a prion infection to show symptoms in part because of the time needed to convert the normal proteins within the body into abnormal ones. My experience as an infection preventionist seeing prion illnesses in patients is pretty vast. And I have to tell you, it's probably the most sad and most debilitating process that can possibly happen. And once your signs and symptoms um, occur, usually the illness is so far progressed that you don't really have much longer to live at that point in time. So it is very, very sad and very, very difficult to diagnose. Um, usually you have to have some type of autopsy of the brain to actually see the prions. Um, because there's not really good testing um, other than like a biopsy of the brain to find the prions um, in their state. An infectious agent can only infect a person if it enters the person's body. Transmission is the path the infectious agent takes to get to an uninfected person. So let's talk about those routes of transmission. A person becomes infected when infectious agent encounters that person, survives, and thrives. Infectious agents are transmitted either by direct contact or indirect contact. The CDC defines direct contact as the transfer of the infectious agent from the host directly onto or into the body. This is typically through direct contact with an infected person. The skin can be a departure point. Bacteria and parasites on the skin transfer to another person when touched. Direct contact also occurs when body tissues, fluids, and blood containing infectious material contacts or enters the body. Staff members can have contact blood and body tissues when collecting samples from patients or when re reprocessing bloody instruments in the sterile processing department. Direct contact also covers contact with infectious fluids during expulsion from the infected person. This is referred to as droplet dispersion. Sneezing is an example of droplet dispersion. It relies on the physical force provided by the reservoir to send the infectious material to a new person. Droplet dispersion should not be, should not be confused with airborne transmission, okay? There's been a lot of discussion between droplet and airborne. Indirect transmission involves a vehicle that carries the infectious agent from the infected person to another person. The vehicle can be a thing, surface, or living organism. Airborne transmission is a form of indirect transmission because the infectious agent is suspended in the air on dust or as droplets. The key word is suspended. Suspended particles can travel long distances on air currents, whereas droplet dispersion relies on the physical force provided by the host to send the infectious material to the host. Airborne transmission relies on air currents to send the infectious material to the host. This is why, remember I talked in the beginning about your tuberculosis patients. Tuberculosis or suspected tuberculosis patients have always been placed on airborne transmission because those little mycobacterium tuberculum are in the air and they're very, very tiny particles and they just kind of hang out for a very long period of time. So that's why those patients have always been in airborne isolation. The second vehicle that carries infectious agents to the host is a fomite. Fomite is a fancy word used to describe an inanimate object that carries infectious agents. Items are contaminated and the contamination is deposited in or on the host when the fomite comes into contact with the person. Anything can become a vehicle for the spread of infection when it is contaminated with infectious agents, even your own breakfast. So what are some of those fomites we might see in healthcare? Well, that might be an IV pole an IV pump, a blood pressure cuff. Maybe it's a mask that wasn't cleaned properly. Um, for example, for um, you know some type of procedure. Maybe it's the sterilized instrumentation. All of those things can become fomites. So the last means of transmission is vector transmission. Vectors are living organisms that carry and directly transmit the infectious agent. Fleas that carry the plague bacteria Yersinia pestis in their gut 
are an example of a mechanical vector. The gut of the flea allows the bacteria to multiply and grow. The flea acts as a conduit for the bacteria when it bites the person. The bacteria in the gut are transferred into the person during the feeding process of the flea. In some cases, the vector is necessary to create an opportunity for the infectious agent to change and become infectious to humans. Fleas can also be an intermediate host. An intermediate host allows the infectious agent to change and mature. Only the form within the intermediate host is infectious to the person. Ingestion of a flea containing cysticeroids of the Diplidium canium will infect the person with a tapeworm. Hmm, sounds delicious, right? Well, you may recognize this common vector, right? Pretty pesky, doesn't matter where you live. I don't care if it's Florida, you're in the mountains in California, or you're here in um, the New England area. But this common vector is called the mosquito, right? Mosquitoes are prolific vectors responsible for the spread of a multitude of infectious agents. It is not surprising considering that there are 3,500 species of mosquitoes. Most notably, mosquitoes are responsible for yellow fever, dengue fever, malaria, encephalitis, West Nile, and Zika. Really interesting um, story as well is my father was actually bit by a mosquito. He was like on a trip and he was super sick for quite a period of time. And they had no idea um, until they got an infectious disease doctor on board that he actually had West Nile virus. And he became extremely ill during that time until they were able to diagnose and treat it. So the last link in the infection chain is the susceptible host a person who will become sick when exposed to an infectious agent. Many factors influence a host's risk of getting sick, health conditions, age, immunizations, past infections, and natural immune defenses all play a role in the host battle against infectious agents. So whether old or young, athletic or average, anyone can be a susceptible host. Several factors help protect potential hosts from infections. People in good health have strong defenses to fight off infectious agents. Eating healthy foods and regularly exercising has been shown to increase the body's defenses against infection. Immunization prepares the body for potential exposure to a specific infectious agent by training the body to make antibodies against the vaccine's targeted organism. The first few weeks of mother's milk gives newborns antibodies that defend them against some types of infections. Vaccinations for measles, mumps, chickenpox, and the flu all prepare the body to fight off their infectious agents. The opposite conditions, poor health, poor diet, and exercise, and the lack of immunization makes a person more susceptible to the infectious agent. Patients undergoing treatment within healthcare facilities are some of the most likely hosts for infection. Many already suffer from pre-existing medical conditions and undergo treatments that lower their ability to fight off those infections. Infectious agents can follow many paths to infiltrate the human body. Many can enter through natural cavities such as the nose, mouth and ears, or mucous membranes like the eyes. Others bore through the skin to enter the muscle or bloodstream. Some find wounds or compromised skin through which they can invade the body. When an infection is the result of an exposure to an infectious agent during a medical procedure or hospital stay, it is called a healthcare associated infection or an HAI. The top infections in no specific order are central line associated bloodstream infections or CLABSIs, MRSA bloodstream infections, urinary tract infections, hospital-acquired Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, and surgical site infections. The amount of healthcare-associated infections over the years has increased dramatically, and it's something that we battle with every day. Surgical site infections caused by the transmission of infectious agents can have serious consequences. Additional treatments can prolong hospital stays and add additional costs to both the hospital and patient. 
serious infections may result in amputation and even death. So let's stop. Preventing the spread of infectious agents to patients is the main goal of infection preventionists, but they don't do it alone. Stopping healthcare associated infections is everyone's job. A hospital acquired infection cannot occur unless specific events bring the infectious agent to the targeted person. These events are referred to as the chain of infection. The chain begins with the infected person or reservoir. Infectious agents leave that person. When the infectious agents are transmitted to another person, either directly or indirectly, during, including using a vector, the infectious agent enters the proper location of the person and multiplies. The susceptible host then becomes a reservoir for that infectious agent and the whole cycle repeats itself. Removing any one of these key elements will break the cycle and prevent future infections. The sterile processing department is just one department that employs many techniques to break the chain of infection, thereby preventing the transmission of diseases to patients and staff. The hospital and department policies should apply the principles of infection prevention that target these elements in all areas of the facility. Sterile processing staff are the most likely reservoirs in the department. However, any person can be a reservoir. Vendors, contractors, staff from other departments, and other temporary visitors are also potential reservoirs. Policies and procedures should be in place addressing actions to take for a reported staff illness. Things to consider might include, what actions must be taken when a staff member becomes ill? For example, food poisoning may be handled differently than the flu. What to do with people and items exposed to the sick person during the incubation period? Do they require reprocessing, recleaning? What about the items that were disinfected? When can a sick person work and what precautions should be taken? For example, athlete's foot, foot may be okay, but shingles may not. These are really common questions you deal with, with when you're in infection prevention. You'll get phone calls saying, well, I have shingles. And you have to determine whether or not that person can come back to work. Um, you know, if they have shingles on their chest and it's underneath their clothes, it's very low risk. But if it's on their arm or on their hands or on their face, it definitely puts the patients at risk. I'm sure you've heard of the illnesses such as norovirus. Norovirus is a fecal oral um, illness and um, it can aerosolize when you're flushing the toilet and things like that. So it's super important during outbreaks of norovirus in staff in a healthcare facility to really think about potlucks and hand washing and cleaning with bleach and doing um, possibly looking and seeing whether or not your, uh, your waterless agent, like your alcohol agent, has an impact on norovirus because most of them don't. So there's lots of different factors to look at. Be sure you have sick policies and procedures that include vendors and contractors. We're learning a lot about this, especially with COVID, right? We have signs posted that say, don't enter if you have a fever, a cough, a runny nose, symptomology at all that could lead you to believe that somebody might have COVID. Staff should take steps to prevent the shedding of infectious or opportunistic microorganisms. They're using hair and beard nets and sterile processing, hospital supplied clean scrubs and shoe covers to capture escaping organisms. It may be allergies, but every sneeze, sniffle and cough can release millions of infectious agents. And they also may not be infectious to you, but maybe the people around you. Encourage practices that prevent them from escaping. Coughs, coughing and sneezing should be done into the elbow Immediately dispose of facial tissue once used, wear facial masks during illness incubation periods, showing following exposure to respiratory infectious agents such as influenza. Wash hands often to reduce the microbial population and shedding. Consider wearing gloves when transporting items such as endoscopes that are ready for patient use but not packaged. So it's also important to remember to encourage your staff to stay home when they're sick. Um, over the years, we've definitely, you know, dragged ourselves in the work. How many people can say, I went into work even though I was sick. Um, it's important to support your employees and your staff um, to not come to work sick, to 
to have really good sick policies and practices as a facility so that people will stay home when they're sick. Um, it's definitely their, their work is their livelihood, but unfortunately, a lot of times they will put themselves in harm's way and others because they, they need to work. So we have to have really good policies and practices and support so they know that they can stay home when they're sick. Infections agents travel through the sterile processing department, for example, in a variety of ways. Finding these routes and stopping transmission is the second way to break that chain of infection. The most obvious vehicles are reusable medical devices and equipment. Microbes are transferred to the device during the procedure, after which they are carried to a susceptible host. Additionally, items handled by nurses, doctors, and others during the procedure or patient care become contaminated with their microorganisms. Water also harbors organisms that can cause disease. Tap water, hoses, spouts, drains, and even treated water can harbor and transfer Pseudomonas aeruginosa and other opportunistic microorganisms to all things that it touches. Staff and visitors can also be vehicles carrying infectious materials from the world outside to the confines of sterile processing. For example, if OR staff decide to take a break in their car and their scrubs and they come in back into the building and they don't change out their scrubs, they're taking things from the environment outside um, back inside and you could possibly be bringing that to the patients. Whether a floor with C. diff outbreak or an outbreak in a completely different hospital, microbes can travel on the shoes and clothes of vendors, visitors, and contractors. Controlling transmission means eliminating the vehicle or the infectious agents. The preferred method to control transmission in SPD is to eliminate the infectious agents. For this reason, all items must be thoroughly cleaned and treated with an appropriate microbiocidal process to prevent transfer of infectious materials to the next person or the work area. Policies and procedures should be in place for inactivating and disposing of instruments with suspected exposure to prion transmissible agents. Remember that SPD staff members are susceptible hosts too. How do you handle instruments that go through the pass-through window with bare hands or with gloves? Using barriers like gloves, closed bins and totes and sealed bags prevent infectious agents from transferring from the contaminated device to the staff members. Personal protective equipment such as masks, face shields, and gowns are necessary protective barriers for staff members. All water sources that could possibly contact patients, reusable medical devices, and patient care items must be monitored. And when necessary, microbiocidal processes used to eliminate those microbes. Many of you may know or not know that hospitals are required to have a water management program and part of that program is a multidisciplinary committee looking at those high risk areas, deciding how often to test the water, what the water should be like, whether it be in the hospital or in sterile processing, looking for dead legs in the wall of the hospital that could um, hold on to organisms and then transfer them to patients later, or even areas of the hospital that are no longer in use. That ends up being a dead leg to your water system. And you can definitely have a lot of organisms hanging out in that environment. Since the majority of hospitalized patients are already susceptible to infectious agents, it is very difficult to break this link in a hospital setting. However, some steps can be taken to help reduce the risk. For example, in the SPD, staff should be encouraged to vaccinate, including hepatitis B, flu, and chickenpox, right? Because they're handling devices that have um, organic and inorganic uh, fluid on them. And we have no idea if the patient had any bloodborne pathogen illness and we're constantly handling those instruments. So we definitely need to encourage them to protect themselves. Medical screenings for opportunistic organisms prior to medical procedures of the patients can identify potential infection risks and allow healthcare professionals to administer preventative measures. So, when we think about this, managing the spread of infection is a complex and multifaceted challenge. To successfully reduce the risk, all healthcare workers must act as infection prevention advocates. By gaining knowledge about the principles and factors involved in infection transmission, sterile processing departments will be empowered to support all infection prevention policies and procedures in their department. 
They will protect themselves, their coworkers, vendors, clinicians, and of course, the patients whom they ultimately serve. It's also important to remember that there's incidences in healthcare facilities that um, people don't know a whole lot about. Um, not sure if you're all familiar listening to the call uh, about infectious agents that can be found, um, you know, for example, in scopes and um, how those can be transmitted to patients. We have to think about breaking that chain of infection by making sure that we high level disinfect, um, liquid chemically sterilize or sterilize those scopes um, to make sure that they are processed safely for patients because then they can transmit an infection to another patient. Um, when I was doing infection prevention in the hospital, you would do a lot of outbreak investigations if you had anything that looked like a cluster of infections. For example, C. diff. I remember at one point in time, I had one patient with C. diff on the floor, but then I ended up having three additional patients show up positive. Um, one patient wasn't there for anything that would have made them susceptible. Another patient just had a, the other two patients just had total joint procedures and, you know, were susceptible, but definitely should not have gotten it for just being there for a day or two. And so after some deep diving and research, you know, finding out that it was possibly spread through the process of just going from room to room to room and not doing super good hand hygiene. Um, so all of these things can come together um, in healthcare and can contribute to a susceptible individual um, becoming ill. So the action items I'd really love for all of you to take away from this is looking at those areas in your facility, in healthcare, in your clinic, your environment that could be infectious transmission um, possibilities, high touch surfaces, high traffic areas, procedural environments, your equipment, your patient rooms, and the big ones, your, your fingers, your, your hands. Those are huge infectious um, transmissious agents, as well as remember those healthy or unhealthy employees. Um, become familiar with your infection prevention policies and practices. Make sure you have in good infection prevention programs, whether it's an ambulatory surgery care, whether it is a clinic, um, all of those IP policies, procedures, and practices are important. Um, they should be evidence-based. They should be based off CDC guidelines or Amy guidelines, CDC standards, um, anything that you can pull into those infection prevention policies to really have a robust IP program. Um, IP programs um, need to be ever-changing. Um, evaluated all the time. And we know now, right, with um, COVID that we have this outbreak um, and pandemic that really needed to be brought to the forefront of these infection prevention policies and programs. So I encourage everyone to be an infection prevention advocate. It is super important. It's everyone's responsibility to speak up and make sure that they know what the right thing is to do at all times and um, hopefully you have a just culture in your facility that everyone is feels very comfortable being an infection prevention advocate for all of the patients because we're their voice when they're on an operating room table or they're in the healthcare facility and we're the last line of defense that they have and we need to protect every patient to our fullest extent. So these were our references for today and I wanna thank you for attending and I want to open it up to questions that anybody might have. Marcy, any questions that you can see? No, we don't see any questions. There's no here. questions as of yet. Questions will come in during the day though. Um, so we will always be able to talk about that. But somebody did have a question earlier. And I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one was about dental. They were asking about sterilization, decontamination in the dental world. Right, is there a specific question about that or what do you think? They wanted to know because it's really considered a dirty procedure. So they were trying to understand, right? The infection 
in the room with doors open, the heat and humidity, um, and following exact protocol. If you've been in some of these oral oral offices, they're not quite handling that. Yeah, it's it's definitely become more more popular nowadays to really talk and be more in depth with dental offices. We're being called in, um, you know, as as clinical educators and just as corporations. Um, all over the country, we're being called in to look at their processes and reevaluate processes because we have to remember that just like in sterile processing, you know, people who come into sterile processing are trained on how to do that process. But for example, in a dental clinic, we go to school to be dental assistants and hygienists, not necessarily somebody who's processing instrumentation. So it's definitely an area of need. Um, I know that I was at my dentist just about six months ago, and I questioned the hygienist because the instrumentation that was sitting on the tray in front of me that she was going to use on me had a large hole in the peel pack, and I requested a new peel pack set that was totally sealed, and she didn't quite understand what I was asking her, but it pushed patients hugely at risk, right, because it should be treated no differently than an OR procedure, and those peel packs can't have holes. They can't have um, watermarks on them or staining on them. Instruments have to be cleaned properly with multi-step processes following IFUs. Um, a lot of these facilities have tabletop sterilizers, so the process is much different. Um, and then thinking about, you know, the risk to the patient, right? Because if there's any bio burden that's left on the device, it then turns into biofilm. And then if we're doing a procedure on a patient, that can transmit to their bloodstream very easily. And if you get a bloodstream infection after a dental procedure, it can be, it can be fatal. It can go to your heart, it can settle on your heart valves, destroy your heart valves, cause heart failure. It's, it's, there's so many different, you know, just goes downhill from there. So the first line of defense for dental clinics is processing safely. It's, you know, cleaning, decontaminating, and training people properly according to their IFUs on how to sterilize that instrumentation. So huge risk, um, definitely much more, much more in the news now than we've heard in the past. Good question, though. Well, we, we want to thank you so much for that. Um, this is a great presentation. So everybody knows um, we will be sending out links where you'll be able to get slides, presentations, and as a reminder, this day today is no credit. There are no CEUs. This is a completely pro bono. Everybody's dedicating all of their time and services. So at our next program, there may be credits. So I just want to let you know that uh, right now there's not, and it's time for a little break, and we will be back with dealing with difficult physicians. Thank you. Thank you.